Hello, this is Drew Collins, rector of St. Andrew's Anglican Church in Savannah, Georgia. Today is the fifth Sunday after Easter, commonly called Rogation Sunday. It is the 14th of May. I would invite you now to pray with me the collect appointed for today. O Lord, from whom all good things do come, grant to us, thy humble servants, that by thy holy inspiration we may think those things that are good, and by thy merciful guiding may perform the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Here beginneth the 23rd verse of the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have received, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and I have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father." His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Well, the prayer book lectionary has kind of taken us uh, round back again, if you will, uh, to the moments or to Jesus' last moments on this earth before his uh, crucifixion. We, of course, are in the, today is the fifth Sunday after Easter. We're in Easter, the Easter season and Eastertide. And, but yet, for some reason, uh, we go back and we recount those, those moments. Some of this has to do with the fact that on Thursday of this week, we will commemorate the ascension of our Lord one of my favorite feasts of the year, and one that sadly almost always gets short shrift because it always falls on a Thursday. But we will be having a commemoration of that here at St. Andrew's Church, a noonday uh, said service of Holy Communion, and I invite you to join us if, if, you, if you're in the Savannah area. We would love to have you join us for that service. But Jesus is here speaking to them, and indeed, if you look at at where this occurs in the Gospel of John, this occurs right before Jesus' high priestly prayer and then his, his betrayal and arrest and ultimately his, his crucifixion. But he tells them that in that day that they would ask nothing of him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. Until you, now you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. Well, first of all, what day is he talking about? He is talking about the, well, there are a couple of theories about what day he's talking about. One of the theories is that this is after his uh, resurrection or perhaps after his ascension. I suspect it is at the end of the age or it will become most fully manifest at the end of, of the age when he returns again. But he said, truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And we have to be careful about that because there are times when in Jesus' name can become almost a magic talisman that we attach to our prayers uh, unthinkingly. To truly pray in Jesus' name is to, is to pray after his will or after the will of God. But he says, whatever you ask in my name, he will, God will, the Father will give 
it to us. Until you now you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Well, there was a reason why the disciples had not yet had not at that point been asking things in Jesus' name. And it has to do with the fact they were faithful Jews. They would have not considered doing so at that moment. But of course now in the in the post resurrection, post crucifixion, post ascension church, we typically frequently append in Jesus' name or in the name of thy son Jesus Christ our Lord to prayers. Now it's worth noting that not all prayers have that. The Lord's Prayer, in fact, does not have that, but typically it does. Regardless of whether or not we say those words, we are enabled to ask and we are enabled to pray because Christ's work on the cross has been finished on our behalf. And so he says, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. He's not talking about here about pie in the sky, by and by, or prosperity gospel kind of joy, but he's talking about the more of God that we can, the more experience of God the Father we can have, the more we can be privileged to think God's thoughts after him, the more joyous we will be as Christians. Then he notes that I've said these things to you in figures of speech. Now they were, he was doing that because they could not fully comprehend and understand the things that he was telling them. There's a sense in which we will not, uh, we cannot fully comprehend God. God is so much larger and holier and more and greater than we. But there is certainly a sense in which, uh, in which now, empowered by the Holy Ghost, we are enabled to understand ways in which the disciples before Pentecost, before the fullness of, of the, the gospel being expressed to the nations at Pentecost and, and the Holy Spirit being poured out in a new and powerful way, that they could not. And so Christ often used figures of speech. It's a very common thing. If you have children, no doubt you have used figures of speech with your children or if you're trying to make the complicated simple, uh, you often use figures of speech or analogies. I've noted that true intelligence is not being able to make the simple complicated, although you find people who delight in doing that. True intelligence is being able to take the, the complicated and make it fairly simple. I remember when I was uh, a soldier, when I was uh, serving, and I was trying to, uh, a, a young enlisted man who did not have much formal education had asked me a question. I forget the exact question, but it had to do with economics. Now, I don't fancy myself an expert in economics, but I was able to explain at least the basic concepts to this young soldier. And listening to me, was another soldier who had a college degree. He actually was in graduate school at that time, uh, pursuing a, a seminary education. But I was explaining to this young enlisted man uh, this concept, and I, th I think I related it to uh, the production of, of mag wheels, because that was something I knew he was interested in. And at the end of our conversation, the other enlisted man said, Sir, you did a pretty good job of making macroeconomics simple. Well, uh, if that was the case, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad, because uh, that's my goal, to make the complicated simple rather than the simple complicated. But it's, that's common. in our. We, we all do it. We all use figures of speech. But he's telling them that there will come a time when he won't to use figures of speech. He will speak plainly about the Father because they'll be able to understand it. As their knowledge increased, they'll be able to understand that which at that point they could not understand or were not ready for. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that you will ask the Father, that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you loved me and believed that I came from God. In that day, now 
Christ is always there interceding for us. But the point is, because of what he did, we are able to approach the Father because his blood has, has washed away our sins. He has paid the penalty for our sins, and so we are accounted as holy before a holy, righteous, and almighty God. And we are able to come before God and boldly approach the throne of grace because Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. And so the Father, we are told that the Father loves us because we loved Christ and have believed that he came from God. Then he notes, I came, I came from the Father and have come into the world and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. Back in 2017, a new administration was being formed in Washington and appointments were being made for ambassadors and whatnot. And I remember listening to a uh, to a radio broadcast, an interview with a career foreign service officer who had served as an ambassador to a couple of countries. He had worked his way up to do that. And they were talking about the difference between political appointees and, and career foreign service officers. And he noted that um, they had a saying in the foreign service that you never get a call at, uh, at 2.45 in the morning to say, pack your bags, you're going to Paris. No, you get a call at 2.45 in the morning saying, pack your bags, you're going to Mogadishu, Somalia, or you're going to uh, Iraq, or you're going to Afghanistan, or you're going to somewhere where there's going to be danger, where there's going to be unpleasantness. And so you reluctantly go. Hardly ever does the State Department call a foreign service officer and say you're going to this plush assignment, at least not at 2.30 in the morning. You're usually having to angle to do that. Well, Jesus, in coming to the earth, in coming into our world, it wasn't like that, that he got a call or that he went reluctantly, but there, that he got a call and it was like, well, I really didn't want to do that. Jesus voluntarily came and gave up his position for a time and meant much he did not give up his, his 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 godliness or his divinity but he gave up some of the prerogatives of that divinity to be born of a woman to suffer or to to well to suffer ultimately but to have many of the same limitations and and, and finite limitations that we as human beings have as he did that He's come in, come from the Father, he's come into the world, but now he's leaving them, he's going to the Father. Why? So that the Holy Spirit may come and so that our joy may be full, so that our experience of God may be full. And his disciples, listen to this, they say, ah, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone, anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. They finally seem to get it. But what does our Lord say? What does Jesus say? He says, do you now believe? No doubt they did, or they thought they did. Now, it may have to do with the fact that he has not told them what is about to happen yet. He says, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. And will leave me alone. His betrayal, his abandonment by his own people was very near. It was about to happen. And Jesus says, now that time has come. You think you understand, but you don't, under, you don't, you don't even begin to get it quite yet. It may have seemed that he was alone, but he was not alone, for the Father was with him. The Father was with him to the end. And he said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Christ wanted them to have peace, and it is ultimately only in Christ that we can find peace. He notes that in the world you will have tribulation. 
And tribulation is something that we experience uh, in our own lives. I found out this week about a friend who had experienced tribulation, took his own life. That is how severe tribulation and trouble may seem. But we as Christians can rejoice. Because when it seems like we have tribulation, we can know that Christ has overcome the world. We may have peace, not because of our earthly standards or situations. We may have peace because of who we are and whose we are in Jesus Christ. Because he has overcome the world. Thanks be to God that we serve a Savior who has overcome the world, who has beat back the forces of sin, Satan, and death. Thanks be to God that no matter what this world throws at us, we have in Christ an advocate, a friend, a Lord. And in him and through him, we now have are privileged to have a new relationship with the Father through his finished work. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen.